All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from Houston, Texas by Julio Cacho and Juan Carlos Herrera from Quantor Capital. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Excellent. Good. Excellent. And we're going to talk about a really interesting subject today, and that is science-based investing. Uh, and I'm fascinated to learn more about this because let's face it, I mean, most of uh, a lot of the investing that people do today is either gut-based or a little bit of research-based or recommended by somebody else-based. So uh, I'm interested to hear about science-based investing. So let's dive straight into it, uh, whichever you want to want to kick this off. Uh, yeah, I'll let Julia kind of explain a little bit about what the, the term is, and then I'll kind of give pro, uh, contrast to traditional investing. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, yeah, so uh, science-based investing is basically using the scientific method to actually perform the investments. Uh, so and the scientific method, it is just the typical scientific method, the same way, the same that you use in any field, uh, but instead of using it in math or physics or uh, biology, we're using it in investments. And, and it turns out that, of course, you can apply that method to any field. And one of those fields could be just investing. And basically, scientific method is a procedure, a methodolo methodology that uh, observes something right? in reality, then proposes a hypothesis. You test the hypothesis, and then you invite others to replicate your testing and your, uh, and your results. Uh, that's how we advance and we progress in, in science. So the same, the same way we can do it here. Uh, so what we do is we observe what sci scientists have found that is robust, that people have replicated, and then we use those findings to implement different portfolios for our, our, our clients. So that's that's basically what we what we do in a, in a big picture kind of way. And to kind of compare that to traditional yeah. investing, so you basically have, for example, market forecasting. Market forecasting in a science-based approach, well, uh, the, the the academic literature and the empirical evidence is pretty clear that that's almost an impossible task, right? Nobody pretty has a crystal ball, mm -hmm. and so we believe that market forecasting is unpredictable, right? Whereas traditional investing you know, believes that market swings, you know, can be anticipated with certain skills or certain research. Um, you know, the theory of science-based investors is guided by peer-reviewed empirical evidence, tested in practice, right? Whereas in traditional investing, it's guided by, you know, either someone's proprietary analysis or opinions, like you said, right? Um, success def is defined here also differently, right? Success is defined by the probability of achieving a specific goal as opposed to traditional investing where it's the, the goal usually is to outperform the market, right? Or else right. you do, you know, an active kind of investment strategy. The risks factors are also uh, constrained in, in a science-based investment approach. The costs are lower. Um, there's less turnover of portfolios and the taxes are more, it's more tax efficient to do it too. So those are kind of like the, 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 the comparisons a little bit between. Yeah. The, so, so tell me a little bit, um, like you were just saying there, that uh, the goal is outperform the market for most people, right? Uh, yeah. But you're saying that in a science-based approach, you you come up with a, a a target or a result or a goal that you're looking to achieve, and it's more defined. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, look, the, the term outperforming the market is loosely is is is, is thrown out. It's thrown mm -hmm. out very loosely, right? What what is it? What actually what does it mean, right? Outperforming the market. Um, um, the academic literature basically states how hard that is, right, over the long haul, right? Um, and this is because of this zero-sum game, you know, in costs. So the zero-sum game theory, you know, basically, if you can just uh, look at a bell, imagine a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. A bell curve where the middle of the bell curve is the average market return, right? The, the middle. And so therefore, for every person that outperforms the market, there has to be someone that underperforms it, just by definition, right? And it has to be by the exact same amount, right? or else you wouldn't have the market return be the average in the middle. But then you add costs to the equation and that bell curve, that, that middle line will shift. So now you have less people, uh, 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 um, the majority of people will now underperform just by that simple arithmetic, right? 
And then what happens is, is there's, and the evidence also shows that there's no persistence in outperforming. So those who do outperform in one period of time are not the same ones that outperform in the next period of time. So what happens is it gets shorter and shorter, smaller and smaller and smaller. The people who are outperforming over time, you go out 25, 30 years and you're left with like 3% <laughs> of the people that yeah. outperform. And even those so, that outperform, you don't know if it's luck or skill. That's the hardest. Well, that's, <laughs> that's very true. I know my investing is probably all luck, but anyway. Um, but, but yes, but it's a great point though. Uh, so for, for, most, for most people approaching this, I mean, there's tons of information out there. There's lots of different, uh, you know, people have different methodologies or they say they have or different ways of assessing things. And so there's so much information out there. And yet when it comes down to it, you know, people still make a lot of investing choices, either, as we said, based on somebody else's opinion or their gut or something they read in the newspaper in the newspaper online. Uh, so when so when you approach this, when you talk to people about, okay, we're going to take a science-based approach, what 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 is their normally their initial reaction? Uh, it's it's all over the map, right? They they're interested and intrigued by it just because you know anything that's science-based is it, uh, um, there's a lot of um, meat usually behind it. Um, and then what they end up seeing is that like, look, there's a difference between outperforming the market and making a higher return than the market. Those are two different statements, okay? I can say mm -hmm. I can make a higher return than the market by taking more risk. And so the basic concept of also science-based investing is understanding that risk and reward are related, right? They're two sides of the same coin. And the question should be for most investors, how much risk are you willing to take? And then the goal should be maximizing your return based off of that risk. What happens is that most of us just go with a higher returning investment sometimes without really understanding how much risk is there? Is it worth the risk reward, right? And that's the, that's the main, I think, point that we try to address to people. You know, it's not that, oh, the S&P is up 10%, it's impossible to make 20% returns. No, it's completely possible to make 20% returns. You just have to take more risk, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the concept that people have a struggle seeing, right? It's different if I just bought Amazon and that was all I held. Well, that's a lot more risk, but yeah, I'd be, I've beaten the S&P by just owning Amazon. Right. And I'm also taking a lot more risk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like when people go to the racetrack, you know, and you look at the odds on the horses and you think, yeah, you know, the one, the one that's like 200 to one, that's fantastic if I put money on that. But the chances of that coming in are very slim. Correct. Um, and 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 that's the that's the kind. And I think when it comes to investing, people are all, people are always looking for the 200 to 200 to one guaranteed winner. Exactly, exactly. And there's no guarantee, and especially in investing, there's no guarantees. You don't know. And, and and the worst part about investing is, you know, at least in horse races, at least you kind of have past performance is indicative because you can kind sure. of see the talents. You know, if, if I see, a, you know, a, a racehorse is just a, an incredible breed and he's amazing. Okay, well, maybe I have higher odds of saying that that might win. The problem with investing, though, is that there is no evidence that the past performance of some good fund manager is actually going to persist in the future. So that's what it really that's where it really becomes tricky, because we, we as humans love to invest in things that have done well recently. We're going to give money to someone who shows us a great performance that they've done recently. But that's actually a terrible investment strategy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the 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 steady people we tend to ignore, and we go for the you know the flash in the pans. Uh, so what are, when 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 it comes to the science base, what are some of the key components that you actually examine? Um, so, uh, for example, uh, what we do is um, what Juan Carlos was saying, right? First, we tell people that expect the return and risk are related. So, people have to make we want to make sure that people understand that, right? And what that means is that if you have a client or that doesn't want risk, doesn't want risk, then we're going to tell that person, okay, you should expect very low returns. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want high expected returns, then you, you have to be ready to take a lot of volatility or risk. So, those are the two things that we, we, we make sure that people understand. Once that they understand that, then we tell them, okay, not all the risks are the same. There are risks that compensate you and there are risks that do not. For example, if you were to a casino, to a casino in Las Vegas, you are, you, are, you are taking risk, but your expected return is negative. 
you're going to, on the long run, you're going to lose money. So you're not getting compensated for that. However, if you invest in all the companies in the world, then you're going to be compensated because you are taking systematic risk, the type of risk that compensates you because you are providing liquidity to the market. So uh, once people understand that, okay, if I put all my money in, in one company, yes, you're going to take a lot of risk, but a lot of that risk, you're not going to get compensated. You, you should not expect to be compensated. It's like going, one part of that is like going to a casino. From some part, you're not. The part that you're going to get compensated is how correlated that company is to the market. That part, you're going to be compensated for that. Uh, for the idiosyncratic risk, you're not compensated. So then once people, one, once people understand this, then we tell them, okay, the other fact that we know is that most investors do not outperform the market in the long run. That's a fact, most. Uh, actually, Fama, in a paper of 2010, he estimates that professional, 97% of the professional fund managers do not outperform in a 30-year period. So given those facts, then what we tell the clients is what you should do then is to try to replicate all the market in the world. So in other words, to invest in every single asset in the world. That would be fantastic. If you could invest in all the assets in the world, proportionally the way they exist, and that would be the, the best thing because that's the benchmark of the benchmark. What we know from, from, from theory is that most people are not going to be able to outperform that given the risk. Once people understand this, they're going to say, okay, but the return of investing in all the portfolios and also in all, all the assets, maybe it's relatively low. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's 3% or 4%. And also the volatility is going to be low. But what if I'm willing to take more volatility? What if I want, as Juan Carlos was saying, 20% returns and I'm willing to take that fluctuations? Then what we tell to people is the, 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 what science tells you to do is you should leverage your portfolio. That way you increase your, both your expected return and also you increase your volatility. It's the same thing that many people do in real estate. In real estate, many people in, buy a house or buy a building, but they use mortgage. Yeah. That's leverage. So they are borrowing money to invest in an asset that people are hoping is going to appreciate more than the cost of the financing. The same thing you can do in, in financial assets, but instead of just putting all your money in one asset, what we suggest is diversified across all this all the companies in the world, all the countries in the world, all the bonds in the world, all the natural resources in the, in the, or commodities in the world, and then you use leverage because that portfolio is the one that is going to maximize your expected return per unit of risk. So that's kind of what we... Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's fascinating, you, you know, so spreading the risk. And I like that uh, analogy about the casino, because there's still a lot of people who don't understand the fact that they're never going to outperform a casino. Right. Uh, and that's why they do so well. Uh, but, um, but it's a great, it's a great point there. So, uh, so basically, uh, I mean, basically, it's an education process too, for people, right? Because I mean, most people dive into all of this without really educating themselves about the about the the risk return, as you say, I mean, most people want the want the high return and the low risk. But the but I like the fact that this 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 huge kind of broad diversification is very is very interesting. You know, I, I'll, I'll comment on that because it's true, right? It's there's a there's a big educational component to this, but there's also there's also a temptation component to this. I, I look at sometimes investing, and I can compare it to dieting. Right. If you want to lose weight, um, you don't have to go and buy 50,000 different diet books. It's pretty common sense, right? Like just, yep. you know, less and exercise more. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's just like that's, that's the basics, right? It's like everyone kind of knows this conceptually. The problem with it is that we are surrounded by temptations when we eat, right? It's like uh -huh. social temptations, your cookies, your, your, your it's everywhere, right? And so it's hard to stick with it. 
investing is kind of the same way. The, 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 the right way, the, the optimal way of investing, it's been out there for about 70 years. The problem is, is there's so many distractions. There's so much temptation out there that we lose track of it, right? The guy who won Bitcoin and it went up about thousand percent last year or the Tesla guys or the tech or every time you turn on the TV or somewhere, it just bombards you with temptations, right? And we have this fear of missing out that if we're not on that train, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be left behind, right? Or the, game, the GameStop boys who, uh, who really exactly. shook things up. <laughs> and that's the thing. I think fear of missing out is a big thing, right? That we have this FOMO and these temptations that just drag us from doing the right thing, very similar to the way diets go, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a, I, I think that's a great analogy, actually, yeah, because it is. We, we fundamentally, we know what to do, but actually doing it or doing it consistently over the long term, yeah, is the difficult part. And I guess that's it because... I mean, this fear of missing out because, I mean, let's face it, if you follow the, if you follow, uh, you know, financial media and all of that, I mean, you're bombarded all the time with all these, all these great new opportunities or areas maybe you should be getting into. And it's, it's very tempting to, to bounce around. And I guess that's part of it is, is having, is, is the investor having some discipline and setting realistic expectations and realizing like what kind of an investor are they or how, how, what's their time frame that they're willing to be invested for these kind of returns? Right. And that's, and, and I think that, look, most people don't know how much risk they're willing to tolerate. That's, I think, mm -hmm. where a good, you know, financial advisor, a good someone, someone that can help them with that process, understanding their goals, their needs, how much risk can they actually tolerate by explaining to them the risks, right? You know, a very simple way of saying this is, look, if you have a 100% equity portfolio that invests in all the companies in the world, well, you have to be ready for a potential 50% dip at some point in time, right? And then people will say, well, then tell me when to get out. Well, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. We know that we, we know that from the evidence that says that we can't market time. Right? That's a losing strategy. So if we can define the risk at the beginning clearly, and we know that if we any money we put into a index of the world stock market, right? Okay, well, we own the largest companies in the world. And if it's down 50%, well, I need to make sure that I'm going to put money in there that I'm going to not touch for at least 10, 15, 20 years. And if it's down 50%, I can rest assured that, look, if the 9,000 largest companies in the world go to zero, we have got bigger problems in the world, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and so I know that if I just do that, right, I have a higher probability of probably outperforming most people that are trading equities. Same thing with the real estate market, same thing with the bond markets. But again, this is boring. This is like a strict diet, right? It's like people hate being on strict diets because it's, you know, it's not fun, right? It's more fun to be in, in Tesla. <laughs> it's more fun to be in a private equity. Look, we, we are human beings and we love stories. A good story of a good investment thesis or a fund will always probably attract people more than the boring data stuff. But the boring data stuff is the correct, right? It's, the, it's what's going to be the healthy diet in the long run. No, no, hundred percent, and I and I think that's that's a as I said, I think it's a great analogy because I mean, too many people just just dive in and uh, and I guess we I mean, I guess part of the thing you probably bump up against is yourselves is that we live in in this kind of shortcut culture today where everything is like instant gratification. So uh, when you're talking to people about okay, you're going to take this, you're going to take a more um, in-depth approach as you said like maybe a more boring approach but one that will give you more return in the long run it's um you know you are in some ways fighting against this shortcut culture absolutely absolutely and i think that's um that 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 is um that is that is really well said because look um we always say you know try to get rich slowly <laughs> don't, don't 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 try to race it right you know a good a good analogy is you know warren buffett he I think it was like the you know when he he made I think it was like eighty percent or ninety percent of his of his wealth came after he was sixty years old or fifty years old and that's compound interest right because it starts accelerating at the end right and so right now he's worth eighty billion dollars but the, the I think it was like seventy nine of that eighty billion was made after he was fifty years old and um, and there's a really good book out there called the psychology of money that, that I got this from it just that just came out that, 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 that we didn't write it but it, but it's a very good read because the psychology factor the psychological factor is what prevents us most of the time from be doing these you know simple things in our finances and, and investing and, and and it also goes to like the younger you are and the sooner you start saving and investing the more fruits you're going to have for that everyone kind of knows this right but it also we just 
Now, most of us don't do it. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but because also, we want to spend our money. <laughs> yeah, but, but also I think that even if you like to gamble or if you're an entrepreneur and if you want high expected returns, you can, there are ways to do it also. I mean, more efficient ways to do it. So, so for example, I can give you a simple example. If you believe that this is more likely that the S&P is gonna go up tomorrow than down, you could lever up as much as you could uh, and just bet that. That's a better bet than going to Las Vegas and put all your money in red in the roulette. So that's much better trade-off. So there are way, scientific ways to also take bets and to also be entrepreneur. Um, so that's also a message I want to send. It, it's not necessarily you have to be a lot of patient. As long as you are risk toler tolerant, you could take huge bets, but you make you 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 have to 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 make sure that you understand why you are going to get compensated and why you are going to get a positive expected return, and then you decide if you how much as I was saying, leverage in the case that I was telling you. So it's possible. The only thing is that it's better to, to understand where you are getting paid from. That, that, that's the idea. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's a really good point. I, I think so. It's like an, it's, it's educated gambling, if you like, you know, you're taking, exactly. you're going, going in with your eyes open uh, and you're doing, you know, there's some, there's some science or something behind the decision that you're making and, and you're, you know, you're, you're accepting the risk, but you know, I mean, putting everything on, on red or black in. Uh, it's kind of like card casino. counting. It's kind of like card yeah. counting, right? If you know how to card count, I mean, you're not guaranteed to win, right? You could also lose all your money. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, if you could do it well, there's a high probability. Again, the probability is higher that in the long run you could beat the casino, right? And that's why they've you know banned all these power corners and stuff. Um, same thing with what Julio is saying there, right? You know, we're kind of trying to play the game of the of the of the card counters. If you're trying to make these big bets, what he's saying is that look, there's ways to do it that'll improve your odds much higher than the odds are of you going to the casino. <laughs> yeah. No. I know that's doesn't, a, that's doesn't a great. Mean, Great doesn't point. mean you'll win, right? Does if you, you can still lose all your money, <laughs> but but the probabilities are just higher. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no guarantees in life about anything, is there? And I think the, the last year and a half have certainly uh, certainly brought that home. Uh, so, to, um, just um, is this a good? Just the last question here. Would you advise? Is this a good time to invest? You know, I'll start by off by saying what we always say: it's always a good time to invest if you're investing for the long haul. Again, the market timing. If you're if you've got if you're sitting on some cash, if you're look, I'll just say this: the worst thing you can do is leave your money in cash. The Federal Reserve and every central bank on planet Earth are 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 waving your their hands and telling you, "Hey, guys, we have a mandate to create inflation, two percent, right?" So they're telling you, "Please, for the love of lot, for the love of God." go spend your money on something and contribute to the economy because you're spending as someone else's income or go and invest it because you're also going to contribute to the economy. What the banks don't want you to do is to hoard it and keep it in cash. Okay. And so they're telling you that that worst investment is going to be cash for the long haul. So just by knowing that, then you, then you should say, well, I should invest. Now, how you invest and when what you invest in, that's all depends on your risk tolerance and how you want to combine it. But it's better to always be invested, even if it's in a very conservative way, than to not be invested. Mm -hmm. It's like that old saying, isn't it? Like the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the second best time is today. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Well, li um, listen, thank you so much. Thank you, Julio and Juan Carlos. All of the information about Julio and Juan Carlos and the company uh, Quantor Capital will be below this video. But before we go, please do just tell people a little bit more about yourselves and your company. So Julio and I um, are actually partners in two companies. Quantor Capital is a asset manager that we founded in 2015. And in 2020, no, in 2019, we also became partners of Inscription Capital, which is a, a registered investment advisor here in Texas. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we've been around for, for a while. Um, myself, I used to work at Citigroup prior to being um, um, in, in this field. And, and Julio was uh, formerly at Ziff Brother Investments. Um, you just want to say a little bit about your background, Julio, in Princeton and stuff? Yeah, so I have a PhD from Princeton University in economics. My specialty 
uh, is in portfolio construction, optimal portfolio construction. Uh, all my paper, academic papers have been in that area, all my research. Uh, I have spent the, my last 15 years uh, working on implementing op optimal portfolios uh, using uh, the, the scientific method. Um, and currently I also teach at Rice University. I teach uh, investments, uh, asset pricing, optimal portfolio. So all the things that I was sharing here also I teach uh, at Rice University. Uh, great. Well, listen, thank you both so much. A fasc fascinating insight. And I would encourage uh, the, the watchers and listeners to go check out what you do. As I said, all the information is below this video. Um, so thank you again for today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.